All right, welcome to video lecture number two. We're going to talk today about z-scores and probability. Um, just in review, building off lecture one, we learned about graphical representations. At the end, we learned about density curves. So we're going to build off that knowledge first to talk about z-scores. Uh, and then we're going to get into probability and figure out why is probability such a central concept in a statistics class. And hopefully by the end of this, we'll create a foundation that you can build on when we start talking about inference and statistical testing in future lectures. All right, to begin with z-scores, I think it's really important to remember the 68.95.99.7 rule. Uh, that we finished with during our last lecture. So just as a reminder, this is a normal distribution. So it's symmetrical, it's bimodal. Uh, the mean, the median, the mode are all at the same position. And what we learned about the normal curve is that 68% of the observations lie within one standard deviation of the mean, uh, that 95% lie within two standard deviations of mean, and 99.7 lie within three standard deviations of the mean. So we're going to continue to build off this. We're going to use what the, these properties to help us understand how we can learn uh, more about the relationships and the research questions that we're studying and how we're going to use this knowledge of the normal curve to lay a foundation that will help us with our statistical inference and statistical tests. All right, I think the best way to think about a z-score is to start with an example that uh, I think is familiar to a lot of us. So let's say that you're a grad student, you don't have a ton of money, but you really need a laptop this semester. Everything's checked out from the library, and so you need to go ahead and buy one. And so you go on a website that compares laptops from all over the world. Um, and what you're struggling with, though, is that it's there's no standardized currency, right? Not everything's in dollars. So some might be in yen, some might be in pesos, some might be in British pounds or dollars or euros. And so you have all these different currencies. So I want you to think about, well, how do you know if you're getting uh, the best deal? What is it that you do? What process do you go through in order to uh, know which laptop is the cheapest? And so obviously what you need to do, if you think about it, is you need to convert all of those different money into the same standardized format. So for us, probably the dollar, since that's what's most familiar to us. So we take what are different currencies and we standardize them into one that we all know about in order to figure out which laptop would have the cheapest deal. So now we want to apply this same principle to what we're learning about normal distributions. So we said that lots of observable phenomena in the world actually follow this pattern of having a normal distribution. So you can think about height and weight uh, and many other things that we observe actually in the long run tend to be uh, in this normal distribution. But notice that they're on different scales. So weight might be in pound, height might be in inches. So we want to figure out a way that we might be able to compare measures on different scales, but both have normal distributions. So here, for example, on the slide, we have reading and math scores, uh, SAT scores and ACT scores or GPA, height and weight. Um, each of these will have its own mean and will have its own standard deviation. And these units will differ, right? Height and weight have different units of measurement. But just like the foreign currency example, we want to think of a way or we want to engage in a process where we'll be able to convert those units onto the same scale so then we can compare uh, these two different normal distributions. Uh, that is equivalent to converting Japanese yen into dollars, for example. So it's on the same scale. So here's an education example that we have here. So let's say we want to compare math and reading scores, but notice here they have different means and standard deviations. So this is just a sample, and the samples aren't super large, but you can tell that looking at both of these histograms, on average, these look like they're going to approximate a normal distribution. Um, but we know the math scores have a mean of 50.81 and a standard deviation of 8.73. 
Uh, but the reading scores have a mean that's slightly lower at 48.56 and has a larger spread or larger variability with a standard deviation of 10.21. So the idea is I want to compare how my students are doing in math and reading, but I have different properties of the distribution here, different means and different standard deviations. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we create standardized values or z-scores. And you may remember this from your statistics class if you've had any in the past. Usually one of the first statistical tests that we do is thinking about z-scores. Uh, a standardized value or a z-score is useful because every data point receives its own z-score under a distribution. And it tells you how far that data point is from the mean in terms of standard deviation units. So this student was one standard deviation above the mean for an IQ, going back to our example from the last lecture. Um, but now we want to compare how far above the mean a school is in the math distribution and the reading score distribution. So is this school one standard deviation below the mean in math, for example? The way to calculate a z-score is actually pretty straightforward. All that you do is you divide the deviation from the mean by the standard deviation. So if you go look at the, the formula here, an individual z-score, remember each score receives its own z-score, uh, is an individual observation. So that might be a school's average math test score, or if it's at the level of an individual, an individual's test. Uh, my, subtracted from the mean of that school or of that classroom, divided by the standard deviation. And that's going to put it at a standardized value. And if the z-score is positive, that means that you are above the mean. And if it's negative, that means that you are below the mean. Now we can compute a z-score from data points from any distribution, but z-scores are a lot more useful when the distribution is normal. So z-scores tell us how many standard deviations the data point is from the mean. And knowing what we know about normal curves, then we can know what percent of the data are to the left and right of that specific data point where that standard deviation lies. So given a z-score, you can know the probability that scores fall above or below that point. So we'll come back and revisit this a little later in the lecture when we talk about probability, uh, but the next slide will help give us a visual example of what that looks like. What does it look like to standardize uh, values? Okay, so notice that we have two normal distributions here. On the left, on the green normal distribution, uh, we have a mean of 1010 and a standard deviation of 20. And so this isn't standardized, right? This seems maybe this is SAT scores or something like that. Um, so this is not standardized, but the way to standardize it in doing the z-score formula, you then create a new curve. You create what's called a uh, standard normal distribution of the standard normal curve. And that's represented by having a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And you can see that in the blue curve highlighted there. So we standardize the left distribution to make it the right distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. All right, now I want to go back to the standard or the normal curve, and this in case is a standard normal curve uh, that we had the 68, 95, 99.7 rule on. So let's say that we have a z-score of two, and we want to know what percent of the scores fall below it. So I'm going to go ahead and circle the two here. And what the question is, if that's our z-score, if z equals two, well, what percent of scores falls below this? Well, we know that at two standard deviations, 95% of the values fall within two standard deviations. So if we take 100% and we subtract 95, we know that 5% lies outside two standard deviations, but it's symmetrical. So it's not that there's 5% here, but it's really 5% divided by two, so we know 2.5% of the values are going to lie 
outside of two standard deviations on either side. So if I need to know what percent is below two, then I just have to take 100%, which would be all the values, but I know 2.5% lies without that. And so then I am going to get 97.5%. So given a Z score of two, what percent of scores lies below it? Well, 97.5% of the values will be lie below two standard deviations. All right, now I want you to think about, though, what if we don't have a whole integer? What if we calculate a z-score and it doesn't come out to be a negative 3 or a 2 or a 1 where I can apply this rule? Well, that's when we use a z-table to figure, figure out the cumulative density of any point under the curve. So right here, I have copied from our book a uh, z-table. And these may look a little different. If you just Google it on the internet, sometimes the, what they represent is a little different. But for this one, I'm going to circle here. You can see that this is reporting out what's the, prob uh, what's the cumulative density or the area to the left of the Z value. So right here at the top, this is telling you the Z value is negative 3.4 for this first row. And then what runs across the table this way are the hundreds place. So this would be negative 3.30. That's 0 .0003 uh, The proportion is 0 .003 is the area to the left of a z-score of negative 3.40. Now I want to point something out to you because we've been saying that two standard deviations, it's kind of the 95% rule. And it's really approximately that. Because if I were to go to 2.00, Remember on the last slide, we calculated, we said that that would be 0 0.025, right? But if you look on the Z table, it's really 0 0.00228 or 0 0.023. So it's approximately 0 0.25. Uh, you'd actually get the exact value of 0 0.25 here at 1.96. So... The 95% rule, it's really closer to 1.96 on the standardized value, but we just roughly approximate it with two. Um, let's go ahead and on the next slide, apply this so that it makes a little more sense in how you use this table a little more. All right, here's just another concrete example using the Z table. So it's giving you the area to the left of the Z value. So if your standardized value is 1.46, then you go ahead and you find on that first column the 1.4, and then you go over to the 0.06, and you find that the proportion of values that lie to the left of a Z-score of 1.46 are 0.9279, and I've highlighted that there with the boxes, just so you can understand how we read these Z-tables. Okay, so on this slide, this is just a set of practice problems that I think is a good time right now to work through. Um, of course, in class, when we meet together, we're going to do a lot of these application-based problems, so I'm not going to go through these here on this lecture, uh, but I think you should pause, take some time, work through these, use your book, find a Z-table, see if you can find these answers, and then we'll go over these in class. All right, now we're going to shift gears away from uh, the standard normal distribution and z-scores, and I promise we'll bring it back in in this lecture, uh, kind of connect it back when we talk about probability. But we're going to shift gears into talking about probability and why is it that probability helps lay a foundation in a statistics class. So in everyday life, we use this word quite loosely, right? Uh, how likely in our subjective judgment something is going to happen. In a general sense, probability is the likelihood that a certain event will occur out of all possible outcomes, and we call that the sample space. So how likely is it that X will happen given that there might be lots of other things going on or lots of other outcomes that could happen there? Now, to make it more concrete, the classic example is just a flip of a coin. So what's the likelihood that I'm going to get a heads out of uh, all possible outcomes, which would be a heads or a tails, if I were to flip it 10 times, for example? Um, and then we, what, why this is connected to statistics is when 
We use probability to make inferences because we only have access to one sample, right? We might flip a coin 10 times and that's our sample and we get a certain number of heads and a certain number of tails. But we wanna know what would happen if I were to flip a coin an infinite number of times? What would the probability that heads would come up on average across you know, repeated events if I were to do it many, many times or an infinite number of times? Um, and we know that if that's a fair coin, the probability would be one half, right? One half of the time I should get a heads or one half of the time I'll get the tails. And so this relationship between a sample, what I observe in the world, given a limited number of trials, and uh, this theoretical space of the infinite, um, of the population, um, that's going to be the connection that we use probability for when we start making statistical inferences. So I take my sample, and I'm going to try to make inferences from a population. So when a statistician refers to probability, they're referring to something very particular. It's the actual likelihood of a given outcome in the long run, okay, over repeated, many, many repeated events. So if I flip that coin 100 times and record the number of heads, and I do that 10 times, then the distribution would look something like this. So in uh, if you look here on the left, I have proportion of heads on the left and number of heads on the right. I think it's easier to think about uh, the number of heads. So right here, notice that I had one time when I had about 30, it looks like 39 heads that came up. And I had one time when I had 60 heads. But in general, most of three of the times I had 52 heads. And two of the times it looks like I had 54. And this might have been 47 and this could be 43, roughly, right? So I've done it 10 times, I record the number of times, and so I'm starting to get a distribution that happens in doing this limited number of trials. Okay, so in the previous example, I flipped a coin 100 times and recorded the number of heads, and I repeated that 10 times. What if I were to flip a coin, not a hundred, but a thousand times and record the number of heads? And then I were to do that a thousand times, or I were to repeat that process a thousand times. What would the distribution look like? Well, here on the slide, you can see both the proportion of heads or the number of heads if I were to do exactly that. So notice how there are a few examples where I have... Uh, somewhere, I'm going to go the number of heads, somewhere below 459 heads, but there's very few examples, right? And there are a few examples above 544 heads. You can see a few of the trials there. But in general, if I were to draw a line through the middle of this, how many heads would I have? The majority would be at 500, or the proportion would be 0.50 which is what we would expect, right, with a fair coin, that we'd have an equal number of heads and tails. So the idea here is a single flip of the coin done a thousand times, it might yield something lower than 0.5 or 500. But on average, if I were to keep repeating that process, in the long run, everything's going to converge on having that mean of point, uh, 500 times or of 0.5, the proportion. And notice what these curves look like. If you're looking and thinking back to what we just learned at the beginning, notice how over time these curves look like normal distributions. So this leads us to the law of large numbers. And this is just something I want to foreshadow and highlight here, and we're going to bring it back in in future lectures. But the idea is the law of large numbers is if, if I draw independent observations at random from any population with a finite mean of mu, then as that number of observations increases, the mean of the observed values, which remember we talked about being x bar, will approach the mean mu of the population. So the more times I draw from it and the more values I draw, then I will, of course, approach 
the population mean. The sample mean will converge on the population mean. So we're going to use our understanding of the law of large numbers and what we know about the normal distribution to help us with statistical inference. But I'm just kind of laying that foundation here and we're going to build on it in future lectures. This statistical idea of in the long run um, leads us to the idea of randomness. And often we think about randomness in terms of haphazard, right? Uh, it's just how we use it colloquially. But in statistics, uh, it's really a description of the kind of order that emerges in the long run. So we call a phenomenon random if individual outcomes are uncertain, but there is nonetheless a regular distribution of outcomes in a large number of repetitions. So the probability of any outcome of random phenomenon is the proportion of the number of times that outcome would occur in a very long series of repetitions repetitions. So the probability that we get a heads in a long run average we know now is 0.5, right? Or the probability that we would have a tails. Uh, for the roll of a die where we have a fair six-sided die, uh, the probability that we would have a one would be one-sixth, right? Over time, this order would emerge as we did it in the long run. Now, a random variable is a variable whose numeric outcome is uh, of a random phenomenon, and it can be discrete or a, a finite set of values like heads or tails. That's a discrete random outcome. We know we're either going to be heads or either going to be tails if the coin's fair. Or with the roll of a dice, we know it's going to be a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Um, but we can also have continuous random variables, which have an infinite set of values. Now, I want to quickly connect back what we just learned about a continuous random variable to the normal curve or the standard normal curve. So a continuous random variable can take on all the values in an interval. So that might be an interval from 0 to 1 or some bounded number. But it's in any value within that, right? So the probability distribution of a random variable is described by a density curve. And if you think about the standard normal distribution, it really is essentially a probability distribution. So we know that the probability that some value will lie to the left or to the right of some given uh, score that we're looking at, for example, a z-score, uh, the z-table will help us determine that. So I just wanted to connect those, that a continuous random variable creates a probability distribution. And one of those probability distributions that we can look at is the standard normal distribution. And that'll tell us the given probabilities associated with a specific z-score. All right, building on this, we can start learning some principles of probability that will help us uh, in our decision making. So I think this is just an interesting case. The Schlitz Beer Company decided to purchase some time during the Super Bowl. We know how expensive those commercials are. But they wanted to run a crazy, what they was considered to be a crazy campaign. So what they did here, and it's linked, you can actually watch the actual commercial and see what it is. But essentially what they did is they got 100 people in um, – in studio live to say, all right, during the Super Bowl, we're going to run this experiment and we have a hundred loyal Michelob drinkers and we're going to have a taste test. In one mug, you have Michelob and in the other, other mug, you have Schlitz beer. And so these are people that would walk in the day, walk in today and tell you that Michelob was their beer of choice. Well, we're going to run an experiment in a blind taste test. We're going to have people rate and we want to see how many people would actually vote to that, that Schlitz is a better tasting beer. All right, so I'm going to revisit this example, but the idea was, were they crazy? Was this a big risk that they were taking in order uh, to spend all this money to run this campaign ad? And then what was the outcome? Well, I keep using this example of the coin toss, but that's because we know that a coin toss will have some known distribution. I know it's going to be heads or tails, and I know the long run average will be that 50% of the time I would get heads or 50% of the time uh, I would get tails. But other events, the, while the outcomes may not be certain, they can be inferred from past data. So we know that in the NFL, I think this is actually data from when they had the, before they moved the, 
um, kicking back. But we know that making an extra point in football, they had about a point nine four or ninety four percent chance of making that field goal. So just a long run. We gather a lot of data. We know over time what that distribution is likely to be. Uh, similar with weather patterns. There's lots of predictive models that we use in terms of weather, knowing what the past has been, knowing what's coming. We can bring those models together to give you uh, some prediction on the forecast that's coming. But of course, we know that these probabilities are not deterministic. They're just telling us the likelihood of certain events happening. And of course, we all are human and we have our own fears and we have our own personal experiences that may go against what these probabilities might suggest. So lots of people have swimming pools in their backyard and they're way more dangerous than having guns in your closet. In fact, a child is 10 times more like uh, his a child under 10 is 100 times more likely to drown in the swimming pool than be killed with a gun. Uh, but yet the fear around or the perception around that's a lot higher. Or the 9-11 attacks are estimated to have caused about 2,000 additional deaths because people were afraid to get on the planes in order to fly. And so obviously they use other transportation methods, in particular cars, and those accidents were said to have caused about 2,000 additional deaths. Death. So sometimes fear can skew the data, right? Um, but on average, we have probabilities, uh, long run averages that are probabilistic. They're not deterministic. Now we can use probability in other ways as well, especially after the fact. So a lot of the data that I work with, right, are observational data that have been gathered over years. And I can look back on what's happened to provide us with information or answers to research questions. So one classic example of this that I want to provide is with DNA analysis. So more than 99% of all DNA is identical among humans. And each DNA has segments or regions called loci. And in a crime scene, investigators can use these low size evidence to identify the criminal, the victim, etc. Ideally, it is extremely unlikely that two individuals match on 13 of these low side. However, investigators often don't have time or money to test that many. And so in Arizona, two criminals in the database, uh, two criminals in the database masked on eight foci or a probability of one in 117 billion, according to the FBI. So this idea was we couldn't match on 13. What if we match on eight? Well, statistics, the probability would say that's very unlikely to happen. There's one in 117 billion, according to the FBI. But after looking across a national database, they were able to find a thousand such pairs. So the idea was eight's not enough. And if you uh, go to the next slide, there's an example you could click through, and I won't, I won't video comment on it, but you can read about how this evidence was being used and misused. So let's go back and kind of bringing this all together and think about... Um, the Schlitz beer, the Schlitz, that's tough to say, Schlitz beer, uh, bold Super Bowl commercial. Were they so bold? Well, Schlitz had gathered data, right? And they found out that beers of their variety among their competitors, they're really hard to distinguish in a blind taste test. So essentially, which beer you chose was equivalent to the flip of a coin when comparing two flavors of beer. So by getting 100 loyal Michelob drinkers, they knew that the taste of Michelob is going to be pretty close to the taste of Schultz, and individuals wouldn't be able to distinguish between the two. So randomly, if you get 100 people to pick one or the other, we know that on average, probably 50% of them are going to pick one and 50% are going to pick the other. Now, if it went the other way, let's say just randomly, because it could happen, 60 for whatever reason picked Michelob and 40 predict, uh, picked Schultz. Well, that's still a pretty good outcome for them. It's like, look, among 100 loyal Michelob drinkers, 40 of them chose Schultz. But in their case, if the average says 50, that's kind of what they got in the sample if you watch the commercial, that 50% of the individuals there picked Schultz beer. And that was something that statisticians would have predicted would have happened.
There are often times when we really want to know the likelihood of multiple events occurring. Um, and it's important to think about events as independent, whether they're dependent or they depend on each other or they're independent events. So does event, if they're independent, event A does not influence the outcome of event B in any way. So to calculate the probability of both events occurring, then you just multiply the probability of A times the probability of B. And so I hope you take some time to click through this, but this is from one of my favorite plays and movies, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, where the movie starts or the play starts with an individual is flipping a coin and getting heads repeatedly over time. And the idea is what's the probability of that? Well, each flip of the coin is independent. And so that probability gets quite small and then they wrestle around with, with what that means. So enjoy that. So in building on this idea of multiple independent events, uh, the expected value is the sum of all the different outcomes, each weighted by its probability and outcome. All right, so that's a little abstract to think about. So let's give a concrete example with the Illinois digout doubler, dugout doubler, excuse me. <laughs> the expected value is as follows, and you can get that in the back of lottery cards. It'll tell you what's the expected value of winning uh, given each, you know, winning each amount of dollars. So if I pay a dollar, and I get the dugout doubler, um, then I have a 1 in 15 chance of earning $2, a 1 in 42.86 chance in earning $4, a 1 in 75 chance of earning $5, and so on. And you can see these are each independent events, but what I can do is I can add them all up to get a long-range average to say, on average, if I buy, spend a dollar on the dugout doubler, on average, if I were to do this across an infinite number of repetitions, I am likely to make about 52 cents, right? So there are times when I might win $25, though it's small. There are times when I might win $1,000, though it's really small. But on average, if I were to keep buying these, I'm going to end up losing money and only making about 52 cents. This is very similar to why casinos make so much money. I grew up in Reno, Nevada, and so we knew the casinos were big for a reason. We knew they had lots of tricks to keep people in there. But the idea is that, yes, you may hit it big once, but on average, we know that casinos make money um, because of the, the randomness that's built into uh, the games. Now, of course, not all events are independent. That is, knowing that it rained today actually increases the likelihood that it may rain tomorrow. Or if I have one engine go out in an airplane, there's actually an increased likelihood that the other engine will go out. And that could be due to common factors like the maintenance of the airplane or birds, you're flying through flocks of birds, or even that that engine has to work harder, right? Um, this really played out tragically in terms of cot deaths uh, in court. So there was uh, Sir Roy Meadow. I want to say he's a statistician, but I was just kind of making that up. But I'm sure he's someone famous. He's a sir. Uh, he testified that the probability of two SIDS-related deaths was 1 in 73 million. Now, remember, cot death SIDS is something we don't know anything about. We can't really explain it. And so what his assumption was is that these are, because it's unexplained, these are independent events. And given all the numbers on what they knew at the time about the number of SIDS deaths that happened among all the babies born, uh, he calculated that one in 73 million of the chance uh, that there would be a chance that there would be two SIDS deaths within a single household. And because of his testimony, at least 258 parents were convicted of murdering their second child. So the idea was, well, this wasn't by accident. But of course, we know that there are common factors that assuming these are independent events is a tragic assumption, especially for these parents because there are common factors that could be genetic, they could be environmental, there could be some condition, right, that we can't explain that's causing why that, uh, that the multiple deaths might occur within a single family. And so that number is way inflated, right, and had, unfortunately, severe consequences for these families. Okay, this, I'm not going to, obviously, we're not going to watch this, but if you have some time, uh, click on this. This is a great TED Talk, How Juries Are Fooled by Statistics. 
um, from Peter Donnelly that just reinforces some of these concepts of how probabilities and statistics interact can uh, to, to make us fooled, right? Or can lead us to make poor decisions. All right, just as we can make uh, mistakes by assuming that events are independent when they're really dependent, the opposite can be true as well, when we can make mistakes by not understanding when events are independent. And so sometimes when you go back to the casino example, you're playing roulette, so that's where a ball is going on numbers and colors. Sometimes people say, well, they're getting hot, right? But each of those events, if there's no you know, cheating in the game, which there shouldn't be, uh, but if there isn't, then we know that there really is no getting hot because each of those events is independent. Um, and sometimes we see patterns where there really aren't any. So though unlikely these events are not highly improbable, um, but they can still happen, right? So let's say five individuals in a workplace uh, contract leukemia. And it may be, well, what's going on? Is there asbestos? Like, is there some environmental factor at that work condition, uh, at that workplace that have caused uh, these individuals to have leukemia. But of course, that may not be the case, right? It can happen. It's a small, it's an unlikely outcome, but it can definitely happen by chance that these individuals all contract leukemia around the same time and that they all happen to work at the same um, workplace. And so it's this type of thinking, I think, that's really going to help us as we start to think about statistics and inference. How likely is an event occur? right? What's the probability that this event happens due to chance alone? Or what's the probability that it occurred due to something systematic? Is there something systematic that's going on? Or is this just random chance? Um, because again, what statistics is going to tell you, because we're only taking a sample and we're generalizing to a population, we're never going to know the truth, capital T truth, but everything's going to be probabilistic. So most likely this happened, or with this degree of certainty, we know the following. One other concept that's important to account for is the idea of regression to the mean. So I have here, uh, this is Madden 18 with Tom Brady on the cover, uh, but they talk about the Madden curse or business week. Once you're you know, identified as a best manager, that you go into some kind of slump. And so often what happens is we regress back to the mean. So what may be a statistical outlier in terms of the season we, we have, so these incredible seasons that would put us on the cover of Madden or would put us in the Business Week cover, uh, that that next season we're naturally going to regress, that we may not have as good a season uh, as we did before. Um, and so this idea, you know, plays out a little bit with Michael Jordan's children in basketball. There's something so amazingly, you know, Michael Jordan was so great, the greatest of all time, in my opinion, though we could debate that with LeBron. Um, but there's something so great about him that his children naturally are going to come back towards the mean, right? That they, they're not going to be extra great just because of him, but that his children may play out. And, and that tends to play out across generations in the same way. Okay, therefore what? I'm going to try to bring this together. So in statistics, we want to make inferences about a population from a sample that's been randomly selected from that population. So when we gather our sample and we begin to, we begin to explore relationships among that, uh, we want to know are the relationships I'm finding or are the patterns that I'm observing or are the differences between groups that exist in that sample. Is that just due to chance? Is it just due to the mix of people that I randomly grabbed in that sample? Or is there something more systematic going on? Is it that there really are those relationships in the population? Is it that there really are those differences if I were to be able to observe everyone in the population in which I'm interested? Um, but we, again, we only have one sample from an infinite number that might be drawn. But we'll say that if it's a very low probability that that occurred due to chance alone, and the convention is under 0.05, let's say, that if that relationship or if that finding is due, um, has a probability less than 0.05, then we may say that something other than chance is going on that we could say with some degree of certainty that no, you know, even though there is a small likelihood that this occurred due to chance, 
I'm going to rule it out and say that there's something, there's some relationship here. Or there's some group difference um, that we, it depends on the statistical tests we use. So in future lectures, we're going to build on this idea of probability. We're going to build on our, our knowledge of the standard normal curve and of the normal distribution and how it works. So we can determine whether or not the relationships we're examining or the group differences we're exploring or the variables that we're interacting and trying to understand, whether or not they are really related in the population or whether or not what we're finding is due to chance alone. And so that's the idea we want to think about. I just get one sample from an infinite number of samples. How close or how representative is that sample and the relationships I explore of the full population?